Welcome everybody to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream where we have a special guest today as you could see on our split screen. It looks like we're sitting next to each other but we're actually speaking across from each other. Uh, we have a special guest. His name is Sheikh Hashim Ahmed. He's visiting us from California. He's somebody who uh, I'll give a brief introduction about and we're going to have an open uh, discussion about his path coming to Islam and everything he's learned. MashaAllah, he became Muslim. Um, you and your wife became Muslim in California. And then... Uh, not actually. Not in California, but you're from California originally. I'm from California, yeah. He became Muslim, then moved, many people are going to be happy, to Pakistan. And lived a long life in Pakistan, raising children who are, MashaAllah, imams all across the country. I just went to your son Ibrahim's masjid. <laughs> in Long Island, in, I was okay. just in Huntington, Long Island. Oh, really? And uh, where, where he used to be the imam, he had invited me there, and now I think now he's not the imam there, but he still lives there. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Sheikh Abdul Rahman was one of our own for a while in Trenton, and now he's in Sharon, Massachusetts. But mashallah, uh, a life filled uh, with stories and adventures in the life of the deen and the madaris and the masajid. So welcome uh, to our live stream. And let me kick it off with with a story of, tell us about the time when you were young. What was the perception of Islam? How much knowledge of Islam was, was in the air and amongst people? Because that's something that today, everyone knows about Islam. Mm. But in those times, even when I was in high school, Islam was just like only a few people knew about it. Yeah. In America, at least. Yeah. So tell us about that aspect. Okay, yeah, so where do we start with that? So I think probably my first recollection of you know Islam or Muslims would probably uh, kind of an abstract image of these desert-dwelling people mm. that in those days, at least for me, what I can remember, recollect, there was a kind of a, an awe, which is interesting, mm. you know. There was a, I never saw these people. I didn't know anything about. It, but there's something about these 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 uh, Bedouins, you know, in the in the in the, in the desert, mm. which is of course now Saudi Arabia. And I didn't know anything much more about them than that. And there was nothing like you know, Islam was not the hottest thing on the news in those days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. Nobody ever heard of. It was a Muslim. Yeah. A Muslim. Who are they? Um, Somewhere in the east, somewhere. Yeah. So there was no no conception. Yeah. And um, in fact, uh, coming from a basically an atheist home, mm. uh, my father' uh, family they're Ashkenazi Jews from Hungary, mm. originally from Hungary. Around the turn of the twentieth century, they came secularists, reformed Jews, if you will. Um, Somehow or another, my father was uh, totally against anything religion. Mm. We had a synagogue in our back in our backyard. It, from our backyard, if you just jumped over the fence, you'd be in the synagogue. Probably, I never saw the inside of that place Subhanallah. because, yeah, it was like taboo. We don't talk about. We don't think about religion. Is like off the yeah. off the chart. Yeah. Uh, so the, I don't know anything about Islam, um, and then. Uh, you know, I was, uh, my family were very sort of different in two things. Mm. Even though, as I said, my father's from a, a Jewish business family. My mother is from a European mix of Bakpuri, of, that's a long story. Jewish too? No, she's Christian, mm. or from a Christian family. Uh, she doesn't consider herself Christian either. Mm. Um, so we grew up a religious. Mm. And I remember the the first thing that I that that I even a thought of religion was. I remember sitting on a couch when I was about five or six years old with my mother, looking out the, you know, the window of the of the front, you know, of the of the living room onto the street. And somehow I I remember this vividly. You don't remember too many things when you're five or six years old, you know. Yeah. But I remember asking my mother, I said, mother, you know. If, People on Saturdays and Sundays, they go to the synagogue, the church, and stuff like that. So, you know, why, why don't we do that? Mm. I don't know, the fitrati or... Yeah. You know, the, so she said, well, if we do that, then we can't do the things we like to do. 
Mm. <laughs> you know, this, this, that's going to take our time up. You know, why yeah. would we want to do that? You know? Yeah. So there's two things that our family was, you know, into kind of, uh, besides just being the all-American, you know, kind of work and, and, and house and home. But my family, they were all musicians. They were mm. all into music. So I grew up with that. And horses. And this is in California. Which part of California? No, now this, I'm born in Cleveland, by the way. Oh, Cleveland. Yeah, I'm born in Cleveland. Mm. My parents are from Cleveland. So my very early childhood was in Cleveland. Mm. Uh, as I said, somehow my father, he was enamored by horses, cowboys, and mm. I, he always wanted to do that. And so eventually, uh, in 1960, you know, so we had moved out of the you know main city of Cleveland out to the suburbs where we had our horses, we had mm. stable, and we had so we were big into horses. But your dad wasn't the immigrant. His dad was <clears throat> the immigrant. His grandfather was an immigrant. Oh, so you've been American for. Oh, two generations. Yeah, and you're the like third generation. The, eight, the, la the latter part of the 1800s is when my okay both sides oh, of the before family the world came. wars even yeah yeah so they weren't even part of the world wars no okay so yeah my father fought in World War II he was an all American in fact you know it's it's interesting uh, we would lie about our age not to get drafted or wow. get out of it I, particularly me in the Vietnam yeah. War era. My father, when he was 17, he lied about his age so he could go and to fight get in. the wow. Japs, you know? You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Nazis, yeah. So he was yeah. a gunner and he was like a wow. radio guy and yeah, you're all American. That's crazy. Do it, get him, you know. Get him. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, we didn't have anything like that. So we were into like horses and my elder sister and I, just like, you know, like we see the traditional people that with Quran, you know, when they're four or five years old in the Qaeda and yeah. you know there'd be a stick on your head so we were like that with horses wow and we had to be horsemen oh wow we used, every weekend we'd be on the road with my father and mother and we'd be attending horse shows really and then you know we had the, the, the group and then we'd be traveling around performing so you, you know? were you were riders for so we show were riders horsemen yeah and, and horse shows that's a and whole culture that's yeah yeah unique yeah to yeah it's it's a pretty interesting. There's like hundred thousand. And we used to go through culture. the Amish country. You know, we were yeah, yeah. we were connected with them, kind of. So you we used to come out of Pennsylvania. Yeah. So well, Ohio also. Ohio. Um, you go up. I think it's like um, Columbus is right next to Pittsburgh, yeah. and that's what yeah. takes you down. We were out in a place called Geauga County, ultimately. So we moved out of the city. We're out in the rural area. Uh, so then, ultimately, my father says, "Okay, so." You know, why am I managing our business, our factory in the downtown Cleveland? Like, I'm going to mm. be a cowboy and I'm going to do it. I'm going to start a guest ranch, a dude ranch. I don't know if you've ever heard of that no. term. This, that, the, the, horse, the horse riding world, yeah. it's a whole other group. <laughs> it is. It's a whole other world. You're right. So what happened was, <clears throat> so he and two other partners, they took a trip and they went out to Colorado. Yeah. And they surveyed around and they found this 500 acres of virgin land, like in the middle of nowhere in the Rocky Mountains, wow. next to natural forest. And the only thing on that property was like a burned down cowboy dance hall. Mm. And it was like a little log cabin that was left of that. And that's all there was on these 500 acres. So we went out there and we uh, developed this resort. Mm -hmm. So, and people, you know, everybody say, hey, dude, what's going on? People don't know, dude. You don't know where that comes from. Yeah, what is this? Yeah. So dude is in Western nomenclature, you know, cowboy. And I'm, it's the city slicker who doesn't know anything about country life. And he comes oh. out and tries to be a cowboy. Okay. He's a dude. I didn't you know. <laughs> so therefore, we call it a dude ranch. Oh, a city man who makes Yeah, he wants to come okay. out there. And actually, that's what we used to do. We would bring families out there. And we'd teach them horse riding and archery and riflery wow. and water skiing. And it was a whole... You know, that's program, crazy. and then in the night we would entertain them with our music and shows. So that's fun. Yeah, it was great. It was yeah. great TV actually. And, yeah. and and how would he get the word out that this business exists? Well, he had a he had a degree in marketing, mm. you know, wow. <laughs> which was supposed to be used for the family business, but yeah. then it kicked in well, over there. Yeah, so it actually became maybe the best, or at least one of the best resorts of its kind. Wow! So that was great. TV so your family me. business. Yeah. That's great. So now, so how does that take us to religion? So out there in Colorado, I mean, as a child, I was very introverted. I'm not like now. I was very introverted. 
and I used to stay a lot to myself and just reflect on things. Mm -hmm. Nature, I used to love nature. That was my thing. So in Colorado, I would just take off into the mountains and just climb up on the mountains and mm. you know, absorb Allah's qudrat. You know, just marvel at that. And so after a while, what my father was espousing, you know, there's no creator. And that doesn't make any sense, you know. Yeah. Come on, we got this. And then uh, in, in the, in the mid-60s, so that's when the, the California thing started because my mother and father were having problems. Uh, interestingly, this is kind of a lesson for all of us. Uh, they were having very, you know, critical, fundamental problems. But, you know, we kids never were aware of it. Mm. They always kept it, you know. I really respect them for that. Yeah. It's ab among many things, but they, they had no clue. So then my mother said, okay, we're going to have a little vacation in California because my grandparents were out there mm. since forever, I guess. And uh, so we took off to Los Angeles. Now, a young musician, I mean, uh, this is the place yeah, to be. Here we go. Yeah. You know? You're right at the edge of Hollywood. You're right, yeah, right in it. What know? town? I was in West LA near Beverly Hills. Oh, okay. Santa Monica and Beverly yeah. Glen, if you're familiar with it. And uh, so, wow, here I am and ready to go. And uh, so now this is the 1960s. Mm, and this all is of it. that stuff is yep. now happening. Now I'm right in the middle of it. Yeah. In the music world, the entertainment world, the artists and musicians and. So civil rights and the hippie movement and mm. all of that, and I'm just immersed in all of it, you know, Spano. right out there in it. Yeah. And of course, at this, at this time, in this age, you know, this, this concept of spirituality, you know, the American dream is turning into a nightmare, right, folks? Mm. It's like, it's not giving us happiness. It's not giving us satisfaction. Yeah, we came here, we, we you know, self-made man, woman, whatever. And then you get all this stuff, and yeah. you have no inner peace. You're, em you're empty. That's yeah. what uh, Rebel Without a Cause is all about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that's what it was. Without a cause, what, what's the purpose? What's yeah. the point? There isn't any. Yeah. You know, so if there isn't any, then just, you know, at large, just do it, do it, you know, like Nike says, just do it. You know, yeah. Whatever comes into your, into your, you know, your, your, your desire, your, your like. Yeah. I feel like it. I your, feel. Your whim. So what, so what is that? Anyway. So then this concept of, no, there's a spirit, you know, and, and we need to find out about that. So that intrigued me mm. very early on. And uh, I'm not alone. I mean, people, a number of people from that era that happened, particularly musicians. The, the, first, the first Muslims in this country, you would know that, you know, they were jazz musicians and criminals on the street. <laughs> Malcolm's type yeah. or, you know, like, like us from the, from the jazz world, you know. And jazz was considered something like um, it was. It was itself. For a while. A, it was itself a niche, you yeah. know, subculture, counter, you know, yeah. thing. Anyway, that's what uh, I don't know if you you ever seen this quote from Sayyid Qutb, mm. uh, the 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 Egyptian writer who became like yeah, yeah, Islamic, uh, um, um, you know, uh, activist. Yeah, he came to America. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, he came to America and he wrote back. And he wrote some memoirs and he's one of the things he said about it is that. This country is doomed, okay? And the source of it all is this jazz music culture. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Said, but I tell you what, I, I don't think he got that right. May Allah bless him. Allah yeah. yarhamu. He had amazing insights. Yeah. But I don't think he got that one right. As yeah. a matter of fact, these were the people that came towards Islam. SubhanAllah. Yeah, from back in the 40s. Yeah. And um, in fact, uh, you know, the Tablighi Jamaat. Yeah. You know, uh, which I was also highly influenced by that early on. So the the the, the founding the the, the Majlis Shura of that originally was five brothers, three of which were Spala. former jazz musicians. Spala. Myself and there was one Lukman. I don't know if you know Lukman. I've never Adin. met him. No. There was one Abdul Raqib from New Jersey. Ajib. Afro two Afro Americans and, and me. Yeah. And there was two Indian guys. You know, and uh, because actually it was. Um, because the black people anyway, the black culture is half of them were Muslims anywhere at yeah. least, and then they're a, they're a much more spiritual, they're much more religiously oriented people, you know, and all the music from the black community stems from the church. Mm -hmm. You know, you won't find any black musician that didn't start in the church. Yeah. That's why their 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 well, their style is so unique and so you know well, recognizable. Elvis too. 
Elvis, uh, Elvis's music started from... He was influenced by that. Yeah. By black churches, because yeah. he was poor, and yeah. he lived next to some of these revivalist yeah. churches, and his shaking... Yeah, his yeah. moves came from those, you know, those wild revivalistic yeah, I mean, churches where they're you know, shaking like up. if you go in the white communities where they got the organ music yeah. embraced, since you go down in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the Baptist yeah, church, that's part the, I mean, it's like a it's like a nightclub. Yeah. You know, that, <laughs> and the first person that really brought that out of the church into the public domain was Ray Charles, who I mm. ultimately ended up working for. No way. Yeah, it was my childhood idol. Because my, my dad really liked him and ended up working for him. So he when he brought that, that genre to the to the stage, they got upset. They said, You can't bring this mm. this is sacred music and you're bringing it onto the you know yeah. you're fi- making it filthy like this. Yeah. He said, Well, that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> so so that was kind of a turning point. But in any case, um so now we have in the 60s, people are starting to say, wait a minute, there's, there's something fundamentally missing in our lives. It has to do with the spirit. So now, you know, since Christianity, Judaism, and, and the, and the uh, you know, the, the established religions that we were familiar with just weren't cutting the cake, you know. Yeah. It just wasn't doing anything for anyone uh, as far as we could see. So where is it happening? So then the eyes turn toward the East, the Buddhists, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Hindu traditions, yoga. Yeah. So we're in all of that kind of stuff, standing on our yeah. heads, doing all that stuff. You know, week-long water fasts and all that kind of thing. Uh, the guru of the, of the Beatles, whose name was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Never heard of him, no. Yeah, he's a very interesting guy. So this guy, he was the guru of the, of the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Which that's another whole. You could have a whole podcast on yeah. that. I Was never it, even knew that they were into this. Oh yeah, you know they started out. I want to hold your hand and I love you, and yeah. they ended up. <laughs> but they ended up with some very profound observations. There was there was two. I would say in our era, there were two, you know, sort of reflectors or mirrors of our society and mm-hmm. critiques of what was going. One with the Beatles, the later Beatles. You know, like. Uh, you take like this song Eleanor Rigby, mm. and 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 the theme of that was all the lonely people. Where did they come from? Mm. All the lonely people. Where do they belong? You know. So mm. I mean, we were seeing that there's there's some fundamental problems here. Yeah. You know, man is not living a human life. So what are we missing? We're missing spirit. We're missing contact with the spirit. We're missing divine guidance. That that's finally what I came to the conclusion I think yeah. we needed. And so we need that guidance. So even somebody like the Beatles, you know, like the, the Rolling Stones, is they're still around, right? Yeah. One of their most famous songs was I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Mm. And the, the amazing thing, people don't reflect on that. The poor guy, you know, he's, he's flying insane. around his private <laughs> jet and he's got his, his villas all over the world, but he says, I, I don't get any satisfaction. Everybody say, wow, wow, great, you know. Yeah. Hey, look at the poor guy, he's, in tr- he's, the, you know. He's empty. You got to feel sorry for them, and so this is what, and, and this is what ultimately, luckily, because you know, then I started seeing, you know, being in the industry and then getting into show business and all that, and then seeing the reality of that lifestyle. Mm. Colleagues, you know, they're all ODing and you know, dying right, left, front. So if you want to live past thirty, you know, better look for a different lifestyle yeah. because this is dangerous. So you ended up getting into that scene and then getting professionally into that scene yeah so job. i was a professional at a very early age what like the kids they were asking me i said how when did you become a muslim i yeah. said when i was 20 years old so we were very young he said well i was i was pretty old mm. i felt like i was an old man i feel much younger now what was the uh <laughs> instrument that because you i was a guitarist basically but i played a lot of things and then how would that work like how would you get gigs or did you join a band or well, you know, like every musician, you know, I started out, when I first got to California, what you would do, you'd go down to the music shop, mm-hmm. you know, and play around with the guitars, and there'd be, there'd be like, <laughs> there'd be like, you know, build, there'd be like bulletin boards, mm-hmm. I don't know if they still have that kind of thing, you know, looking for a guitar player, looking, uh. for, this, looking for that, form a band, and that's how you start, you know, and then you get a contact here, I think the first kind of break was, there was a band that we formed, I was like 17 years old, mm. no, I was probably earlier. 15, 16 years old. Mm. And we had a battle of the bands on some TV station. And then you, so you get to know, and then you get a contact, and you move up, and you move up. And uh, yeah, so uh, 
So getting into that and then, you know, being in that society, then you see this, the sickness and the, and, the, and the hypocrisy and the, this greed and just material. You know, On the one hand, you have an artist that's trying, he perceives things, he's trying to express that in his mm -hmm. art form, whatever that might be. And then you have, you know, these, uh, these blood-sucking, you know, business side of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. just sick. You know, and then the whole thing is just so sick and so perverted and causing such travail. And everybody's, you know, like out of their minds. And so yeah. do I want to live like this for the rest of my life? And I mean, end of the day, what's, you know. And then at the same time, then what I would do, I would take off from gigs. When it got just too overwhelming, I would just take off and go to Big Sur or go out in the desert and mm. fast and do yoga and yeah. tune back in, you know, and then yeah. get cleaned out a bit and then come back and get involved until it got too much. And then finally, I said, no, this is just, this is madness. I mean, we're not supposed to be living this kind of, this is not what we're here for. And I don't know, it's kind of like, you know, it sounds a little like, you know, fairy tale kind of, but uh, in Big Sur, actually, I know Big Sur in that? California. What is that? It's, um, it's on the coastal highway mm -hmm. around Monterey, you know, around Monterey and up in the bay before you get to the bay. It's an area, it's one of the most beautiful places that, you know, it's an iconic place. And it's an iconic place, particularly for the hippies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it would be a perfect Sufi you know, wow. destination, <laughs> you know, like you should have a Khan Club. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's these big mountains, these big, beautiful, huge, awesome mountains that go right down into the sea. You've got these oh, cliffs wow. and this majestic sea and you're on these mountains. Between every mountain is a stream and the wow. forest. It's just fabulous. Wow. So I used to go there and you know just camp out and cook my own food or fast and do meditation, just mm. transcendental meditation. But by the way, when this Maharishi Yogesh, Yogesh guy came, so I was there at LA airport among others to greet him and so mm -hmm. Sheikh, you know, and the guy comes with long beard and painted face. And he's wearing this loin loincloth barefoot. That's oh, wow, crazy. This guy is yo, yeah, that's the this real is thing. It, huh? wow. You know, but then after a while, you know, you realize it's this is really not What do they call to? Hmm? What do they call to? What like, they do their... is they have a kind of muraqaba kind of a thing. They call transcendental meditation. Which is kind of just Calm shut off all down. of your shut off all of your, you know, your your, your other thoughts and just kind of focus on your inner being and your inner, you know, it's, it's just kind of uh, shutting off from the material world and trying to so focus on your spirit. Decreasing their distractions, basically. Yeah. You're th and now they have a kind down. of a watered-down version of that, which would they call, um, what do they call that? Uh, what is it? Awareness or something? Mindfulness. Huh? Mindfulness. Mindfulness, yeah. yeah. It's something along those lines. But that was a little bit more philosophical, yeah. spiritual. It, 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 it tended to kind of touch on Sufi uh, concepts, yeah. you know. And they're, and they're all about, like, um, not eating a lot, not talking a lot. Yeah. Right? Decreasing your thoughts. Exactly. And that's what then... So it was spiritual exercises, you know. And I think in every... Every traditional culture you've got, because people recognize spirit. So whether it was prophetically inspired and got, you know, diluted or, or just it came fitri or whatever. But we find this in all traditional, here in our, you know, indigenous, you know, cultures in, 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 in America, we have you know, yeah. things of that nature. Whether they were originally divinely inspired or not, who knows. Yeah. But in any case, uh, I came to the conclusion that all of these spiritual disciplines are all pointing to one thing. There's a creator, the originator of the entire unit of the control. And if you, if you connect with that, then you're on. Then you made it. Mm. And if you haven't, you're going to be, you know, you're off the frequency. You're not, you're just, you're just lost. And so f I had this kind of revelation that was also a very kind of um, indescribable spiritual experience. Where I just kind of felt like, and this is kind of a thing in Buddhist that they try to you merge with the with the with all of existence. You know, you he would know that stuff. Well, know? today they just right? say the universe. Yeah. Today yeah. they call so it the I universe. So I had so that yeah. actually I had a kind of experience like that two times, mm -hmm. and one was in Big Sur, and and I just from that moment I said, okay, that's that's it, that's it. I'm done with this stuff. Yeah. I, it's like this you is know, what you're all about. Moses coming down from the mountain with it. <laughs> like <laughs> the stuff with love, you yeah. know. You know, I don't want to. But 
it, it was it was really like that. And now, now I'm very clear. This is what I'm going to do. I'm getting out of here. Yeah. And I'm I'm going to search for that. I'm going to look for that. And at this time, again, now going back to your question. Sorry, we roamed here and there, but um, at this point in time, Islam. I don't know anything about Islam other than Elijah Muhammad, right? Mm-hmm. And by the way, Malcolm. So. I, I never met Malcolm, but being a musician and being engaged with black musicians and engaged in the, you know, the civil rights and the, and the black national movement and all that, so I was, you know, really connected with all that. So I was a big fan of Malcolm, mm. and all of us were. Every Muslim my age, Malcolm was like ninety percent of why they're Muslim today. Subhanallah. Yeah, yeah. Allah yarhamu. So you know, after reading his autobiography and all that, and then he then he mentioned about. You know these Muslims, and and they don't have this thing called racism. You know they can actually get along, whites and blacks and blue, green, whatever color you are. It's not an issue. I said, wow, you mm. know that 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 that's unique. I mean, coming from the West, and you know, like that's that's a situation where there's no, as they say in Arabic, qadi uh, Allah abul Hasan laha. No, you know that it's that's a, that's a, that's a situation. There's no judge that's gonna be able to figure that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. So I had come to this conclusion, now being a pretty extreme radical in my own way, being connected with everything radical. Anything that was non-conventional radical, that was, you'd find <laughs> me there. Right? So, so now everybody's going to Tibet and India, so I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I'm going to do something else. And like I had a close connection with Africa, right? So I'm going to, what am I going to do? So I checked out stuff, you know, and I'm looking now with the, con- with the concept that since there must be a creator, he sent these holy people and he sent these, these messages, there has to be somewhere the real one, yeah. the one that wasn't tampered and twisted and all of that. So where's that going to be? So I came up with this idea, you know, that uh, it's going to be in Ethiopia. Mm. Why Ethiopia? Because ostensibly, uh, you know, the early followers of, of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, they migrated to Ethiopia mm. and they kept their tradition and they've got their, all the, and they still have it there in the mountains. And that sounds pretty hip, you know, yeah. like that's, that's pretty awesome. So I'm going to go there. That's so interesting. Yeah. I thought you were going to say Morocco because no. that's where everyone else was going. No, that, yeah. that was a destination. And I also yeah. put that on, 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 the, on, on, the, on the route. Yeah. But but even at that time, that wasn't a destination for spirituality. Oh, okay. that that came later. Mm. That was a that was a destination for the hippies for drugs, drugs and just fraud culture, not necessarily mm-hmm. Islam. I mean, it was, you know, you know, they, they do weird stuff. They have good hashish there. Yeah. It's a very ornamental and yeah. good dancing, and it's a pretty <laughs> weird place and it's different yeah. Oriental. So that that was yeah. the attraction in those days. Um, but Ethiopia. Yeah, so I thought they're going to, you know, uh, these mountains of Ethiopia, that really sounds far out. You know, yeah. That's going to be, so I'm, I'm going there. That, that's how I was. I mean, just, yeah. if I feel like I'm just going to do it. People say, hey, are you crazy? I mean, you know anybody there? <laughs> um, so, I mean, do you speak their, you don't speak their language? You don't know anybody? There? I'm like, what? How, are you, how are you going to connect with any? It's, uh, amazingly, I don't know, Allah put this, he said, look, the one who I'm seeking for knows what I want, and he's going to show me. Yeah, that was the hippie mentality, yeah. you know. That was that was kind of the good teachings that you know. Yeah. We learned, you know, good karma and you know, good vibes go around, comes around, and yeah. so I'm just going to be positive and throw out good vibes, and <laughs> it's just going to vibe me right into what's happening, you know. Yeah. It's interesting, but that's kind of you know that was. Um, so I set off for Ethiopia. That, that's a, we don't have time for that, but that that's a long story. It's wow, how, full of all kinds of. Well, did you? What did? You, how long before you actually got something out of Ethiopia? Well, so as I said, to since see if I the, was to test if these vibes worked. Yeah. <laughs> so. So the idea is religion, right? And, and as I mentioned, so since I'm very influenced by Malcolm also in his. Mm-hmm. And his mention of the Muslims. So I want to go to Ethiopia, but I want to see these Muslims too. So therefore, intentionally, I went to Luxembourg, down through France, and down through Spain, mostly walking and just. I have no time frame, so mm. I just you know. And then I go to Morocco, and then from Morocco all the way across North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, like Egypt. Like busing? By anyway, 
hitchhiking, train, bus, walking, wow. train. That's crazy. You know, I I'm, no, I just, I'm just, you know. You got time. Yeah. And the world is changing. I'm just going to absorb yeah. and just move on at my own pace, yeah. however long it takes. And uh, so when I get to Morocco, it's Ramadan, mm. right? And uh, so then everybody's fasting. So as I said, you know, we used to fast and do these water yeah. baths. And when I get in, they said, the whole country's fasting. Wow. Are you kidding me? <laughs> they said, yeah, even our king, he's fasting. Wow. <laughs> I am, wow, this, this, is, this is unreal. Yeah. And so, I, so immediately it was a, there was a, you know, there was a, you know, there was a, there was a sink, you know. And uh, so I just, and it was, it, 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 you know, Morocco, you, you must have been there. It's a mesmerizing place. Especially in the 60s. Oh, it was, uh, you know, Before all the modernity came in. And um, and then yeah, and then there's this concept white black and all that yeah absolutely there, there, there's no concept of it, you know. As I as I usually I say in, in Isawira, have you been in Morocco? Yeah. Have you, yeah. Have you been in Isawira? No, never been there. Isawira, that was the iconic, that was the hippie destination. Oh wow! You know, if you could if you could hang out in Isawira, that was like top of the line. So actually, I lived there for a while. And I lived in a house, actually. Mm. And I got so immersed in the culture. That was my thing. I could just kind of adapt. Yeah. And I just got immersed myself in their culture and all that. And I became like one of the family members of a family in Isawira. And interestingly, the, the, uh, the, the father must have been have some kind of African background because he was mm. black as coal. I mean, really, he just looked African totally. And then, and then his wife, who's probably a Berber, she was like white as snow. <laughs> so you got black as coal, white as, yeah. snow, and children of the colors of the rainbow. I mean, they're all different yeah. shades and colors, and and it was beautiful, you know. I just said, wow, you know. So, and then I got I got hooked up with Moroccan musicians, mm -hmm. right? And uh, musicians always click with musicians, and, mm -hmm. and so I got into Moroccan traditional mu music. Ganawa, if you, you look at it. I heard up. that, yeah. yeah. I heard it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a very interesting, I was like, trying to explain this to somebody, uh, which, you know, it's pretty hard to explain, but it's it's part of the culture. It, it's it's it, it's definitely satanic. <laughs> 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 no question about that. But it's still somehow connected to the culture. Mm. And it's also connected, obviously, to Islam in a way, even though it's, it's pretty... Yeah. And it's so it's like ritual. It's like ritual music, mm. you know. And you know, it, it it goes on, and then people go into trances. It's kind of like hal, you know, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. You know, you find this kind of. So so I was with them. I didn't really understand all what's going on, but then I I was playing with them, and so I used to hear the adhan, and I used to get really like, it used to really fascinate me. I used to hear the adhan, and then. Uh, and so these musicians were the first ones actually to invite me to Islam. Mm. And so the point is, going back to your question, still I don't really know anything about Islam. Nobody, you know, we don't, we oh, don't have is, any real information about it. Wow, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so I'm not really seeing a lot of truly Islamic things in my musician buddies or the hippie crowd or, you know, people who connect with them. So you don't really get a chance to see really Islamic teachings in that context, yeah. other than like karam, you know, yeah. friendliness, generosity, um, honoring the guests. But, and, but also, if you're in that environment and you see something good, that's like the, the edge. So if, if the goodness trickled down to these people, right, yeah. then it's pretty thick, it's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, that, that's the point. And you know, when people ask me, so how did you ultimately accept Islam? You know, you know. I didn't hear a single ayat of Quran. I didn't hear a single hadith. Nothing. It was all these, you know, glimpses of Islamic character it, during this journey. You know. Ajib. And so, still, I don't really know much about Islam. You know, we don't know. I didn't know anything about the, the prophetic teachings of Muhammad alayhi Nothing about his seerah. Nothing. But seeing these, you know, seeing these uh, these qualities, you know. And then all across North Africa, it was a, it was a, it was, it was a one year journey, approximately wow. before I got to Ethiopia. That's amazing. Yeah. That type I mean, of thing could never happen anymore. Huh? With the world economy and the way things yeah. are, it could never happen anymore. Yeah, all those countries that I went, they're all been destroyed. Yeah. Yemen, I mean, yeah. 
subhanAllah, later on when I went to Yemen. And of the two countries that were most impressive, people usually ask me, hey, oh, what the two countries that really stand out was Morocco and Yemen. So many people say that, and the, the reason is that because they were isolated, one all the way in the West, one all the way in the South, yeah. their culture grew yeah, up exactly. by itself. Yeah. Whereas like Egypt, everyone's there. So it's going to be neutral. Yeah. Right? And, and the thing about Morocco, when, when, when you just leave Morocco and go to Algeria, even though they're very similar people, mm -hmm. ethnically and culturally, but it's a totally different feeling. Mm -hmm. The Moroccans, they love their culture. Yeah. And even if they're not religious, but they, they love their culture. Everybody knows Quran. SubhanAllah. <laughs> Which I didn't know at that point, but yeah. later after, after a few years ago, I went again after all these years. And you know, you, 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 you would have noticed that, that Everybody knows Quran. You know, in the in the masjid every morning you know, yeah. there's a, there's a Jews there, yeah. and that's how you know what day of the month it is. <laughs> yeah, if you want to know what day of the month, just go in the masjid. What Fajr, it is, and whatever 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 you know Jews they're reading, that that's the day of the month. Yeah, because for those who aren't aware of this, it's by law in Morocco. It's a law. By law. By law. I didn't know that. Yeah, and it's endowed by the state that after Fajr, a his has to be recited, which is half a juz. After Maghrib, yeah, the second. Next hizb has to be recited. And it's recited in a group. Yeah, yeah. So the imam yeah. turns around after the sunnahs and everything, and he settles. Then they make a big circle. Right? It's usually two rows connected, like in a long oval. Yeah. And then they recite. And sometimes it's like seven people in the little mosque. It's like eight to ten people. Yeah. And they'll recite. And so many of the people know it from memory. Yeah, yeah. Right? And sometimes you'll have a guy in a business suit, right, sitting. And he's like tired. It's like after maghrib. And he's reciting from memory. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's and it's a middle. It's, it's not like mulk. It's not mulk yasin. It's something from the middle, like Surah Al Furqan, Shara. Yeah, yeah. And they're reciting. So that's one of the, like the most amazing things. And believe it or not, I heard that the first people to do this were the Tabi'in of Egypt, the soldiers, and they were reciting. And it's in the books that they were the first people to do a group recitation because people weren't reciting. And they want the soldiers to recite. So they would do this group recitation. And that that's the same melody that's still employed now in Morocco. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. And it's, it's also, it's, it's, it's almost military-like. It, it's militaristic. <laughs> and it's the same that's cadence, that's right? It's one cadence, boom, 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 yeah, boom, yeah, boom, yeah, boom. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. SubhanAllah. I didn't know that. And I had a friend who uh, was just like, you know, like these regular Moroccans, they love Islam, but there's not much Islam that you can see right away. Yeah. And this guy, he's a family guy here. And he's like, yeah, we're from uh, an area called Sus. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and they're just like, just he's Muslim by his identity. And a lot of things about him are Islamic, but he's not putting much effort into seeing, like, what does fiqh say? What does sharia say? Just, just go in with the flow of Muslim guy. So he says, where I come from in Sus, it was a thing, no matter what gathering we have, you have to end the gathering with Yasin. <laughs> So, yeah. Someone, yeah, that's how they are. It's they're the very, yeah, they're very someone very will just start. Marshall. It doesn't matter if you're, you're you go out. A bunch of guys go out for tea, right? The sign that the gathering is done. Someone will start with yasin, and we all write recite yasin. It doesn't matter. You pray, don't pray. Mm -hmm. You recite yasin. Yeah. Subhanallah. Allah. So yeah. So then you get to Ethiopia, and then did you find what you were looking for? Okay, so that very interestingly. As I said, I still, you know, I still don't know, you know, anything academically about Islam other than what I see, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and in every country, there's 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 new revelations in terms. Of, I mean, we see new things and we see new aspects of human behavior that indicate, you know, the, uh, the uniqueness of Islamic character. Which obviously is coming, and what 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 I was trying to you know correlate was these good qualities like this generosity and this 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 like for example, <laughs> I was uh, I was coming from a place like Gulamim is right way down in the south mm -hmm. near the Spanish Sahara you know the Tawarik, the land of the Tawarik, and coming up from there, and then I passed Agadir. And between Agadir and Isuira, I was going back to my, you know, where I was staying in Isuira. So now I'm traveling on the road, and in those days, you know, a car or two might come in a day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so I'm, it's hot, you know, I'm hot and I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and I'm tired and there's no transport and I'm just walking along the road. I got my backpack and my guitar and, you know, and so I just kind of exhaustedly sit on by the side of the road. So this Moroccan guy comes by leading his donkey and he looks at me and he says like, you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> He says, you look despondent, you know, yeah. like, uh, I, don't ex I don't know exactly what he said, you know, but I mean, it's like, you know, what's wrong with you, man, you know, <laughs> why you, you know? And that's, that's the thing about Moroccans, you know, you probably yeah. noticed that, they're, they're all happy. Oh, they're always happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's regardless. It's such a happy culture. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he's looking at me like, hey, what's wrong with you? Yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, to start with, like, I'm tired, I'm hungry, <laughs> I'm thirsty, and what else you want, you know? Yeah. He said, well, you know what? That's what it is, so why don't you just enjoy it? <laughs> I said, what? You know? Yeah. I said, this guy, I, we thought we were hip. This guy is, like, he's, you know, it's stuff like that, you yeah. know? Well, did he take you on to his doctor? No, no, he just, uh, but I'll tell you another thing, in Libya, the, the, the amazing thing. So anyway, so he, he went on his way, and I said, yeah, he's right. So enjoy it. Yeah, it's bright sky. And yeah, he's That's right. Cool. Absolutely. Wow. Hey, thank you. You know, uh, once I went into a into a into a date market mm -hmm. in Marrakesh. You know, I'm, I'm my my background. You know, natural food uh, dates. Like I have to have dates every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I go to the date market. You got these ten thousand guys in one place selling the same thing. Dates. <laughs> See, that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> yeah. man. You know, why yeah. don't you? You know. Find a place where there's no date, yeah. you know, and yeah, sell so, dates, yeah. man. Come on. <laughs> you know, market share. How are you going to get any market share here? You got 20 times. So I thought, you know, okay, um, these poor guys, you know, Moroccan, third world. I'm American, you know, come from business family. I have a little business savvy. So I'm going to do a, a favor to these guys. I'm going to give them a little marketing, you know, uh, sort of coaching. Yeah. So I went to one of them and I said, hey, you know what? This doesn't make any sense. You know, you guys are all sitting here why don't you, you know, like uh, find a place, Marcus is a big place, you can find it, you know, some place here or there and, and set up your shop and you can probably get, and the guy's looking at me and smiling, you know, like a little kid comes up yeah. to you and says, <laughs> uncle, I think, you know, oh yeah, Sonny, that's, that, that, that's good, yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so he's looking at me like, you know, okay, Sonny, you know. He said, look, he says, if we all sit here or we sit all over the universe, we're going to get what Allah is going to give us. Subhanallah. So, what's the tension, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, again, you know, like, mm. I said, we're supposed to be hippies? Look at what this guy's talking about, you know? I said, wow. So, I mean, so these, these people are on another level. How they perceive the world and what's going on in the universe, yeah. they're on another level. And it's, it's like everybody. It's not yeah. just the clerics. It's yeah, like yeah, everybody's yeah. like that. Even my musician buddies, and they're uh -huh. doing all the things musicians yeah. do everywhere. <laughs> but awesome. still, they've got this level of, you know, differentness, you yeah. know, uniqueness. Okay, now, fast forward. Libya. Mm. I'm in Libya. By the way, in Libya, <laughs> I had a very interesting you know, encounter because now... You know, being a rebel, you know, from the 60s and getting out of America, like, I don't want to see America again ever. Yeah. You know, like, you know, like, this is the worst place on the earth. <laughs> Until you go around the earth and then you find out, well, it's all pretty much like that or worse, you mm -hmm. know. But in any case, so as soon as, in Morocco, I, you know, I was wearing Moroccan clothes. I had a turban, you know, these Tawadik, they have the black turbans. Yep. They gave me, the, and I loved that thing. You know, that was just beautiful. Wrap it around your mouth. Yeah, and, yeah, and I, I just was, you know, mm -hmm. immersed in all that. I was speaking a little, you know, uh, I was speaking some, some Arabic, you know, the colloquial Arabic. <clears throat> and uh, so when I get to Libya, I get across, I'm fine in Algeria, and I get to Tunisia. <laughs> Very interesting. And uh, I got stories for all of that, but we don't have time for all of that. But uh, when I get to Libya, okay, so I, I got across the border, no issue. So I'm in Sirt, which is the place where Qadhafi is from. So where he's and, and he was ruling at this time. And right? he had just taken over at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he had his picture was up everywhere and everyone was, you know, hip hip hooray. Mm -hmm. So so I'm sitting at this little, you know, roadside cafe kind of thing, you know, like bus where bus stops and so I'm uh, you know, I'm having lunch. 
and then I get on the bus and we, we go. So in the meantime, these policemen come. And these policemen are standing behind me and like right behind me. Like, we want you. They think you're a spy? I don't know what they thought, but in any case, they were kind enough to let me finish my food. <laughs> and then they say, we want, uh, our chief wants to talk to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I go to the chief and I say, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Said, You're not you Muslim, that, but you picked up the Yeah, language. I picked up, yeah I'm, yeah. I'm living with Muslim families, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm one of you guys, you know, yeah. basically. Um, so then he said, where are you from? I said, I'm from the United States. He said, what are you doing with those clothes? I said, yeah, I wear whatever I want. No, you can't. <laughs> so this is culture appreciation before that became a thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, this really blew me away. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't believe this. He says, no, you can't. You, you can't wear those. And he was serious. He, was, he got angry, in fact. So you can't Weird. wear those kind of clothes here. You have to wear your own clothes. Weird. <laughs> I said, well, you know what? I don't have any clothes. Like, my own clothes. These are my clothes. He said, well, you better get some. I was going to put you in jail back in Tripoli. Oh, my God. I said, this guy is <laughs> serious. You know? And he said, don't try anything because these two guys are going to be with you. You go and get and change these clothes. I couldn't. So this kind of, you know, what happened to our culture? It yeah. was really weird, you know. Or, or maybe like, is it maybe are you trying to impersonate? I don't know what his psych was, but it was pretty pretty intense. So then I don't have any other clothes, and how am I going to shake these guys, and what am I going to do? So then I get back to the that cafe, and these guys are a little bit behind. Mm. In the meantime, a bus comes. So I grab my stuff and jump on the bus and before they could get <laughs> I was off on my way. Okay. So at Maghreb time, now somebody gets down from the bus, the next stop, and he goes and he buys a big bag of boiled eggs. I don't know if you if you ever noticed that. That's one of the things that you get on the side. And maybe it was of those days, boiled eggs. That's an easy thing to, yeah. you know. And he distributes that to everybody on the bus. So obviously this is he's part of the group and maybe this bus is just a group and they're they're going to Benghazi that we're going to Benghazi. So okay, another guy gets down and he gets a big bag of almonds and he just distributes almond to everybody. Okay, fine. Then we get down at Maghreb around Maghreb time and we have dinner, mm -hmm. couscous. You know, North Africa everybody's got their own kind of couscous. Libyans yeah. have theirs. So we all eat couscous and they're fighting with each other. Who's going to pay for everybody? Yeah. In America, we're going to fight who's going to, you know. Yeah. You know, you pay. No, I mean, yeah. They're fighting who's going to pay. No, I'm paying. I'm paying. So, you know, wow. You know. Anyway, I know they're very generous, but this was like, you know, in steroids, you know. Yeah. And they were strangers. Well, I didn't know that. I mean, I, I assumed they were a, a group. Yeah. Together. Because, I mean, they were just too familiar and they were just, you don't do that with everybody, right? Yeah. Well, we'll see. So... We get the Benghazi. Every single one of them went in a separate direction. Subhanallah. A jeep. I <laughs> said, so like nobody knew, but they they all knew one another, and they all had this fraternity. So this akhwat al Islam and all that. I mean, it's just it's just cut up. Nobody had to tell me in Islam we're all brothers, and and nobody yeah, had yeah. to philosophy. They just this. That's why people always ask, what can I do to be a representative? Just be a Muslim. That's all you have to do. Subhanallah. Your actions are going to attract people in ways you can't even imagine. I'll tell you a story about that, the, the reverse of that. Uh, Sheikh Yahya Rodas and his friend, who was a Afghani, they went out for pizza one time. And they're sitting around, and there's just a bunch of guys eating some pizzas. So the guys behind them, they couldn't help but overhear, the guys behind them were about five guys that ate three pizzas. So they're like, well, guys, what's the math on this? because the math doesn't even out. And then they finally figure out the fraction that works. And then, but one guy interrupts and said, no, but I saw that you had four pieces. I only had three pieces, right? So how are we going to divide this up? Now the Afghani uh, can't believe what he's hearing, right? That they're arguing and they're counting <laughs> like what you ate, okay? Yeah, but I saw that last time you ate four, right? And we split it evenly. So there, he can't believe what he's hearing. So he got so fed up, fed up. He goes up and, you know, these pizzerias, like they'll have like a pizza prepared and they'll give it by the slice. He's like, give me that whole pie now. So the guy puts the whole thing into a box he, and he pays for it. He takes it and he slams it on their table 
And he says, would you all just eat and shut up? <laughs> <laughs> they got the shock of their life. Like, <laughs> like what is this? And here's like the, the Afghanis also, this is like really into their, in, in their culture too, this generosity. Yeah, yeah. So the guys are like, look, is, they looked at him like he's from Mars or something. Like, who would do that? Like, you yeah. just paid for that by yourself? A Muslim would do that. SubhanAllah, we even had a neighbor one time, and we had some burgers, and uh, we had ordered some halal burgers. And we had the burgers out, and she was passing by. So my wife said, Duan, just come on in. And she sits at the table, and we're about to eat. We're unwrapping these burgers. And uh, so naturally, we went and got a plate for her to, to eat too. And she's like, oh, I can have one? We're like, how, how, would, how could we invite you in and eat in front of you, right? So it's like a foreign for a lot of people. Yes, yeah, this, yeah. this This uh, tight-fistedness, and I think it's karam is one of the best. Why does it move people? It's an attrib- It's a reflection of, of iman. Because you believe that there's no limit. There's no limit to the sustenance that Absolutely. Allah has. Whereas stinginess is the opposite. It's like there's a limit. Right yeah. to the to the sustenance that yeah. Allah has for everyone. So it sounds like to me that it's just cut them of the generosity of people that was the biggest. Yeah. Uh, what did Nabi Sallallahu say? The first thing he came to to, to Medina. Ya yeah. ayyuhan nas, afshu salam, wa ati mutaam, wa silu al arham, wa salu wa nas niyam. That's what the Nabi Salam. Subhanallah. Yeah, the first thing that these social things yeah. say salam to one another. He didn't say okay now. This is halal, this is haram, be sure yeah. you do this, don't do this, you know? Get yourselves, you know, together, you know, become a fraternity, you know? Have love for and affection for one another, connect with one another and connect, collect. This is one of the things that blew me away in Islam. The collective connectivity with Allah. Mm. It's not just me and I'm the whole collective. The first time I saw Salat in Jamaat, mm. it blew me away. SubhanAllah. The whole concept that, you know, you have not simply a, your personal connection, you have this whole jamaat. And, and for Muslims, they, 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 it really blows them away because how did you get blown away by something we see every day? We just, yeah. It doesn't even phase us. We never, we never even thought about that. But for somebody who's never seen that, yeah. it's mind-boggling. You know? Sometimes I think the best thing for Muslims is to be tossed somewhere. Now, this is probably not the case anymore because we're all exposed to everything on the internet. But for a Muslim youth... To be flung somewhere far from Islam, we wouldn't actually do that. But when life does that to somebody, uh, there's so many stories of people who their way, it, their appreciation of Islam only occurred when they lost all of it. Right. Not lost it, but they were in an environment yeah. that was totally the opposite. And they realized, wow, like we would never, this would never go on in our society or in our family. I'll right? tell you an interesting story about that. When I was a student in Mecca, we're talking about back in seventies, you know, late seventies. So in you know in, in traditional Arab society, you've got the umda. Yeah, so, you know, the, umda the little uh, informal village chief, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, this was in Mecca, so I mean, every every mahalla, yeah, every you know section of the of the of the town has got the influential guy, like you know, yeah. The, yeah. The, the tribal chief, if you will. But I mean, he's the big shot of the of the area. So anyway. So the umda of that high where we lived in Taysir in Mecca. So he had a little general store and his, his young son used to sit on that store. So when I used to come from the haram at night and, uh, you know, I used to just talk with this kid for a while. Nice kid, you know. So I'd give him dawah and I'd talk with him. Clean shaven, nothing really outstanding, just typical Saudi kid. And he happened to be the son of the umda yeah. <laughs> on top of that. So, and then I, I, interestingly, I gave him, he said, you got any good books you can give me? So I gave him the Riyadh Saudi. Mm-hmm. Two days, three days later, he said, you got any more? That was really good. <laughs> I said, did you read the whole thing? He said, yeah, I read the whole thing, cover to cover. Ajeeb. Wow. <laughs> I mean, but how many of those hadith did you actually act on? I mean, yeah. Anyway, that's great. You did. That. Anyway, nice kid. So one day, he says to me, you know, Sheikh, I'm going to go to America. I want to go to America. What? <laughs> you want to go where? I'm going to go to America. My, my brother's there and he's studying English and I want to go there. I said, man, you, dude, you have no clue what's going on in yeah. America. You, everybody in the world, every Muslim wants to come here in Mecca and you want to go yeah. to America. <laughs> come on, really. 
No, but he, I mean, he was like some him. You know, this guy, he was determined. There's no way I'm going to talk him out of that. Okay, all right. You want to go to America? Okay, let me tell you something. You are an Arab, number one. You're Muslim. You're an Arab. You're from Saudi Arabia. You're from Mecca. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you are the epitome of being a Muslim. Yeah. Everybody's going to be focused on you. You're the you. demographic. Yeah, you're the, yeah. You're, you're the, yeah, you're the, the index, yeah. yeah, you're the index, you know. <laughs> so you go to America, everybody's going to be looking at you, and you're going to be the representative of Islam, and, you know. Don't screw around. If you're, if you're, you can't be messing around over there, you know, kind of like. So if you got to go there, just keep that in mind. And the second thing is, you're going to sink over there unless you get contact with the right people. So I'm going to give you some addresses and some phone numbers, <clears throat> and as soon as you get there, you contact these people, okay? Mm -hmm. He said, okay. Anyway, he goes. I don't see him for the next four or five months or whatever. Then I come back, I'm coming back one night, and there he is sitting on the shop, mm. this time with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Right? Yeah. So I said, Salam uh, alaykum, mashallah. Yeah, and you're back. What is it, Ijazza or what? And he said in his typical Saudi, and I'll never forget what the, the exact, la, 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 ya sheikh, patalta amerika. Patalta amerika. I quit this habit. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. gave it up. I just, you know, threw it out. Yeah. And I said, okay, okay so what happened? And, and that's what he said. So, you know, he said, look, you know, I, I'm born in Makkah. I never saw a kafir. I never saw kufr. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's no way for me to even conceptualize what a kafir and kufr mm -hmm. disbelief we never saw that mm -hmm. you know, in those days you wouldn't even see you know a woman improperly dressed you yeah. know or anything like for that matter and then you know then i went to america and i got and as soon as i got down in the airport it was like shock yeah yeah uh, what do i yeah. do and then luckily i remembered you know you'd give me and i called up this one of our brothers from around here it was JFK he would, he would have landed in. So one of our brothers, you know, picked him up. And <laughs> he said, that saved my life. Otherwise, I would, have, I would have probably died of a heart attack right there and then. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, uh, contrast is an ex extremely important part of shuhud al-minna. Like yeah. You cannot actually, t we, we're supposed to be grateful. Yeah. But I can't be grateful for something I don't really truly understand. Yeah, that's right. And we know a thing by its opposite. So uh, the contrast, the idea of the contrast is so important. There has to be a contrast, yeah. right? And I've always noticed it uh, against my relatives in comparison myself against my relatives in Egypt, mm. who I never got really close to them, but I saw them. And how foreign to them my mentality is to them. And I'm sure a lot of people are like that. They just don't understand why I'm into this stuff, right? They don't get it at all. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's because you guys don't have contrast. We have a great contrast here. Exactly. So the key is, what is the shara'i way of giving youth a contrast? I think in the old days, it was jihad. Go out to the, to the hinterlands, yeah. give da'wah, right? Maybe join the army, see what those enemies are like. Because they're, when they're out in the, uh, uh, on the edges, they're not just there fighting the whole time. Sometimes there's no war. So you go out, go to the marketplace of those, you know, uh, Spaniards or Crusaders or whatever. There's some interaction here, yeah. right? There's contrast. Yeah. But it's Shari. Because you can't, you can't yeah. do it in a wrong way either, right? That's right. Men jahiliya, lam islam. SubhanAllah. Yeah. That's so important. So you got to do it in a way. That's why um, when a lot of people ask me about conferences, said, look, my kids, they go to a Muslim school. They... Uh, two, three times a week, they spend half the day in the masjid, like with me on the job, right? Now, when we get a vacation, I'm not going to go take them to an Islamic conference after that, right? <laughs> it's like, it's too much. Yeah. So I want them to see a contrast. So we'll go to a big city, take a vacation in like Boston, Virginia, or just go camping. Like there's got to be a contrast where they're able, or we join the local soccer teams, like you got to be able to see what that world is like, but in a way that is mashru'a. Where, where you don't get caught by it. Yeah, where they're not going to get caught, and it's not irresponsible parenting. Yeah. Right. There could be a sense where yeah. a lot of parents, they want to do this. Like, I want my kid to know what's out there. 
but it's done in an irresponsible way, you can be asked by Allah what you did. Yeah, absolutely. So I want it to be in a shara'i way and small regular dosages. Yeah. And the big nama for us is that we're next to New York. Because there you'll see like the furthest limit, right? Yeah. When you go when they go to New York City, it's like just the peripheral vision gives you an education about what people are how they're like, what they're going through, stuff like that. And one of the biggest things, it's not like a knock, but on the East Coast, people tend to be a bit suspicious and not friendly. In the South, I think they're friendly. So when you say, okay, go do this, I'm like, man, the people are not friendly here. It's not like uh, going in the masjid and talking to anybody, right? So they're contrast. Yeah. Like, that's so important. And that's probably what you're coming from. And, and he finally got a contrast. This young man in Mecca probably got yeah, himself exactly, a good contrast. Exactly. And now we all appreciate Islam yeah. after that. Yeah, so uh, that's why, just as I said, for example, Salat. Yeah. You've seen it all your life from day one. You've, you've seen Salat, yeah. you've seen masjids. Uh, the first time I saw Salat in Jamaat was on a boat, speaking of Egypt. And mm. I went from Cairo down Nile to Aswan. Mm. You know, Those people way. are really nice down in Aswan. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. It's a whole different thing, Cairo. I, I, I was fine as soon as I got out of the limits of Cairo. Yeah, I was fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, in Cairo is like uh, I just got down there in, in in the middle of the city. I would always look for the cheapest place to live, and it's always in the middle of the city. Yeah, in, in, in the, in the, in the near the opera. There was an old opera down yeah. there somewhere. I remember that name, but I can't remember what it. Whatever exactly that area is. was. Yeah. So and then the, the thing was, you would go, you would just go outside, and all these little restaurants. So you'd have all of these pots and pans, you know, they'd be serving out of. Mm. So the guy that's serving thinks he's a drummer, also, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so he's got to be, you know, pounding yeah. these things. So it's just it's, overwhelming, you know. Yeah. Anyway, so that's I why get, they do so good in New York City, like Egyptians. <laughs> When yeah. Egyptians come to New York to do imagine. business, to, to, to buy and sell in New York City, they steamroll the competition. <laughs> like all the little side businesses, especially food in Egypt, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, in New York City, it's yeah. Egyptians. They've steamrolled anybody who's in the cart business, right? Yeah. Like the, car <laughs> the cart food business. Yeah. They know how to get the attention, keep the attention, oh, keep yeah, it going. They're, great at they're that. such hustlers. Even in Mecca, they used to do that. Yeah. I remember that falafel Allah. guy? Yeah. Yeah, he was. He yeah. was so. We go, I go down to Aswan, and I have to go over this lake, this Buhaira Nasir, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. This is that it's it's there's a big dam at the end of, either I don't remember whether it was in, uh, whether the dam would have been in Egypt or in, or in Sudan. But it was a huge lake, man-made lake, three days journey it was or something like that. And it was this old boat, like Mark Twain kind of a thing, paddle wheel mm -hmm. on the back. And it was, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Like the Mississippi River or something. Yeah. yeah. But this is the Nile, not the Mississippi. Yeah. And, and you're going against the current to go I south. Guess, yeah. Because right. the Nile's the only river that goes north. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's the, only, it's the only river in the world that actually goes really? reverse. Instead yeah. of from the ocean to the lake, it yeah. goes from the lake to the ocean. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So... At the end of that lake, Buhaira Nasir, is Wadi Halfa, which mm. is the beginning of Sudan. So you land in Sudan, mm. you start off in Egypt, and you, and you end up in Sudan, beginning of Sudan. So on this boat, there were these Sudani, there was Bedou, these uh, Bedouins from Sudan, and they used to sell their camels mm. in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And they would sell the camels, and they would be coming back to Sudan. Mm -hmm. and so these guys would call the Adhan on the boat, and then they would offer Salat in Jamaat. Mm -hmm. So I was with another, there was another Afro-American guy who was a bass player, and uh, he thought his ancestors were from Ethiopia. So we hooked up in S1, so we're traveling together. So we're sitting here, two of us, and these guys, they call the Adhan, which I've been hearing all day long, but you know, because they're in Maliki Madhab, you don't go in the masjid. He doesn't allow that. So yeah, they, you know, non Muslims are not. No, allowed. I think it's they're, they're they're looser. But in those days, you know, yeah. they would you were not allowed in the masjid, and you wouldn't dare set foot. I mean, it's like taboo, and so yeah. I never got to go into a masjid previously. I always wanted to do that. Fez and all these places. You could see these places that were just amazing, but yeah. I never went inside. So I never actually saw the Muslims praying, mm. at least in Jamaat. 
So now this guy calls the Adhan, and then I'm sitting there watching. And now, I've never seen this before. Now, you, Ryan can resonate with this probably, you know, but mm. Muslims, they have a saw it. Okay, but, but <laughs> deal, you know, so what? You know, so yeah. what? Are you kidding? <laughs> so how, Allah, and then they stand up in this line. You know, if you go to a church or a synagogue or any of these places, there's nothing like this. Yeah, there's no line. You sing some songs and, and, or yeah. standing in the chairs. Or, these guys are standing up. This guy says, Allahu Akbar, and it's like, cut off. And all these other guys behind, Allahu Akbar. It's like one body, one focus, mm. and it's like, wow. These guys are, this, this is like the most serious thing I've ever seen. You know. And then to totally quiet, totally still, and then Allahu Akbar, like one body, Rukur. Mm. And, and, and keeping in mind, these are Bedouins, you know, simple people. But this discipline mm. is just something out. It's it's it's, it's almost you know superhuman. And then some Allah holy man. Then when they Allah Akbar, and they all went into sajda. Mm. That just blew me away. Subhanallah. I said, Oh my, God, that's it. Subhanallah. That's it. That's <laughs> what I. That's what I'm looking for. That. that. Subhanallah. It Ryan's resonating. Subhanallah. There, right? Yeah, because. I mean, I said, that's the ultimate of humility in front of the Creator. So you can't get, it doesn't get better than that. So whatever religion that's in, that's what it is. And I knew mm -hmm. what religion that's in. So it's like, but I'm on my way to Ethiopia. I've gone all this way. So yeah. that's on the back of my mind. But, but from that moment, it was like, yeah, that, that's what it is. It's amazing. You uh, made the intention to get to um, uh, uh, Ethiopia, but you're getting an education Way yeah. before you yeah, got yeah, there, yeah. subhanAllah. So Allah Taala has, you know, yeah. I, I had a history teacher from Azhar in, in uh, actually most of the teachers were Azharis yeah. in, in Mecca in those days, uh, in the Jamia. So we had a, a Dr. Hassan Shawut, he was a very well-known historian and scholar of Azhar. So when I first met him and I was signing up for his class and he talked to me and he wanted to know, what's your story? He said, هذا لا يقال. <laughs> said that, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, what? What? He wants to hear something logical. Why did yeah, I accept yeah. Islam? And I gave him the, like proofs. He, yeah, he, said, he couldn't figure that out. But we 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 really developed a love affair. I mean, I took his class, and it was it was Asr al Rashidin, and it was just mm. fantastic. Anyway, so um, yeah, just just seeing this, you know, the, the salat. Uh, it, it just like knocked me out. So when I got to Ethiopia, so I still don't know anything other than you know like this. This uh, then I was in Sudan and Sudan, all kinds of things happened. And then finally, when I got to Ethiopia, the the you know the the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, was I actually did end up connecting with these Coptic monks, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that I was you know the, the muksad as it were, and. Uh, and if you remember back, the whole thing was, you know, uh, the one I'm looking for, he knows what I'm looking for. He's yeah. going to take me there. So I didn't know how. I don't know. But, yeah. And, and I couldn't even imagine that that's how it would end up. So when I got to Ethiopia and I found these monks, and I mean, did you talk about Zuhud? Mm. Oh, my God. I mean, these guys, Dunya, there wasn't, it wasn't in the equation. I mean, these guys lived in caves. They eat grass growing out of the, out of the wild. And, wow. You know, I mean, celibacy and... Zuhud and you know, more than a dunya, you know, distance from anything worldly. But in spite of that, there was no nur on their faces. Ajib. Yeah. Ajib. You know, so you know, now you're getting a contrast after Islam. Yeah, after seeing these Muslims all happy, content, yeah. nur, you know, you can sense it. And being an artist and a musician and a hippie and all that, so that's what yeah. we're looking at anyway, you know, that's what yeah. we, that's the vibe, you know. This vibe is not cool at all. Mm. Like, and it's not because their skin was was dark; their countenance was dark. Mm. They just they, they weren't happy. They went like, you know, bashasha. You know, they mm. like you know, countenance of joy or just like you know, mm. like I, I, you might you know recollect there was a an incident where Umar radiallahu passed by some monks. You know, that were in their soma. And, Look at their faces. They're they're so engaged and they're struggling and they're the, the mm. mujahada, you know, the, the the effort and the. But the end result is, you know, yeah, 
is disaster. So that's kind of like what I, it kind of hit me on these. So there was no nuwa. So it, it struck me that the religion that's that's really going to be the, solving the world's problems and it's from the divine. It's going to lighten up. The yeah. kind. It's going to produce. It's going to relax a person. Light, light. Yeah. There's no light. There's darkness on the. Eh, these guys are wrong. Were they I didn't have, have to talk to them. Oh, yeah. subhanallah. I just looked at these guys. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't know. They hey, don't, don't Rai, know. like, you know how I always say that uh, bid'a, fisk, heresy, whatever it is, heresy inside of Islam, uh, untruths outside of Islam, that Allah Ta'ala, out of His mercy, He, he gives a sign on the face of the people yeah, yeah. to the common man who's not going to read proofs, right? And you see that with the monks of Christianity and the hair splitting Jews of Judaism where yeah. these laws they make no sense right like you got this not so unnatural the way you're living this is so unnatural the other side right and even bid out within Islam yeah like uh, the, the Shia flagellation that's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep <laughs> everyone else away like I'm yeah. not doing whatever that thing is that can't be right like yeah, that cannot true. be re uh, God's religion yeah. and then other groups likewise they, they do something to themselves which turns off the fitrah like it's too ugly, it's too wild, it's too extreme, it's too legalistic, it's too denying, like zuhud to an extreme. Yeah. I can't do that. I mean, I got to talk to some of these fitra Christians who became Protestants. It's like, so either the path of God or marrying a woman, right? It's, why, why, why would you put, do that to me, right? <laughs> What's the tyranny of or and the genius of and? Yeah, subhanAllah, that's how it is. So tell, so, so tell me... Uh, just out of curiosity, did they have generosity to the guests? These Christian monks. <clears throat> As I said, I didn't. Re I didn't have to interact with them much. Oh, just the and look. They, they weren't like you know welcoming or anything like that. Uh, I'm interested in this, and it wasn't like. No, it was yeah. just like just, they were aloof and they were. So I, it, it, as soon as I saw them, I was just turned off. Yeah. So that was the end of the story. And by this time, by this time, I, I most of the people I would be connecting with would be Muslims. Mm. That's just how Allah SWT set it up. And ultimately, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's amazing how I actually, you know, just took the, the stance that, okay, I'm a Muslim now. So there in Ethiopia, so I was traveling all around. You know, as a musician, just anywhere you go, you can play music and kind of get over. And uh, so I was traveling around all over various villages so I was in a village, and there was this uh, this fellow, young guy, who was sitting in a little cafe, and then he, he comes out and he says, who are you, what are you? And through a translator, actually, because he didn't really speak English. And then so he says, well, you know, me, I'm a sport man. I mean, I put on these sport shows, like a car drives over him, a boulder uh, on his extremes chest and, and stuff yeah, extreme yeah. weird stuff that he puts on a show and he says you're a musician so let's let's you know make a collaboration and we'll put on shows in the village said, yeah great wonderful so we start traveling around and doing this ethiopian thing. villages in ethiopian villages that's yeah. crazy and now ethiopian villages very interestingly people may not know this where's noah by the way yes, we need no you hear all this i don't know yeah. Noah's, Noah's uh, uh, Ethiopian. Yeah. See what he says here. He said, my father said same thing when accepting Islam from Ethiopian uh, Orthodox Christian backgrounds. SubhanAllah. Wow. Ajib. There you go. Yeah. So, so this guy's a Christian. And uh, there's, a, there's a very distinct divide, obviously, you know, between the two. And they don't really get along super well. And they definitely don't eat each other's food. The Christians and the Muslims. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't notice that immediately, but if you look a little bit deeper, yeah, there's definitely Beno uh, <laughs> Mabarzakh. There's a yeah. clear divide. And uh, so wherever village we would go, and people don't know this perhaps, that at least in those days, this was during the time of Haile Selassie, by the way. No, I'm not so familiar. Was, Who's Haile that? Selassie was that emperor. He was really an iconic for the Afro-Americans also, this guy had some kind of special, like he was the, I forget what they, the Lion of Judah or some, okay. some weird nomenclature they had about this guy. Um, but at any rate, it wasn't a good time for Muslims, not that any time after that was as well. But that was particularly a tough because he was tough on Muslims. So 
any and and half of the population are Muslims. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the first mahjar, right? Yeah. That was the first you know immigration was to to, to Ethiopia. Yeah. And you know, uh, the, the, the the Najashi who accepted Islam, you know, uh, so they have a very rich. Uh, we're hoping to actually have a tour, go to Ethiopia. Mm. We'd love to do that. I haven't been back there since. So half of the population are Muslims. So whatever mm-hmm. village we would go to, like I would gravitate toward the Muslims, and then my buddy, you know, he used to kind of irk him, you know, that was. And then I wouldn't, you know, then I would eat. They don't eat each other's food, and why are you all going with them? You should be with us. No, I don't feel like it. Anyway, <laughs> so we went, we came to this village, uh, and, and I'm just walking down the street. It's a dirt road. It's typical small little village. So some guy comes running up from behind, and he grabs me, stops me, he says, I heard there's some American Muslim in our village. Are, is that you? Mm. So I said, well... I can't imagine any other American walking around here in your village. <laughs> so I, I, I guess that's me, you know. And then he took my hand and looked at me. You see other, oh, yeah, you're a Muslim. What? <laughs> <laughs> How do you get that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, what's that? Now, being the hippie me, you know, yeah, the, yeah you know, what kind of witch dan do we have here, yeah. you know? He says, look, you look at your hand here. You see, that's one and eight, very clear. Uh-huh. Some people, it's not really clear. It doesn't connect here. Uh-huh. And if that's the case, then you got a problem. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. So he said, look, it's one and eight. That's, and then you got eight and one, very clear. 99 names of Allah. Yeah, you're... Oh, my God. God. <laughs> Whatever. 18 and 81. Yeah. And and how did you react to that? I, yeah, that, that's all I needed. To. So all this month, all the, you know, because already all this yeah. time, it's just, I just needed that... Anything just to little push. So all this month knows what is gonna, you know, do for who. So I, that so that's all I needed. Okay, yeah. Okay, done. That's it. Now, did you know about a concept of taking shahada? No, no clue no. whatsoever. Yeah, and I, and they didn't either. So you're just like I'm. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So when people ask you who gave you shahada, nobody. So I you're did. just one Me. of them. One, yeah, I'm I just, just one of you guys. That's I'm it. I'm a Muslim, and so that's it. That's I'm going to do it. <laughs> That's so, <laughs> so now this guy, he turns out he's a school teacher, and actually he knows English. He was, he was an English teacher, that's why he knew English, you know, more or less. So now he takes me home and feeds me this cot. You know this cot, those, those leaves, yeah, leaves that in Yemen too, you know? They, they, actually, they get it from Ethiopia. But, but the best is from Ethiopia. Yeah, that's know? where they get it. Yeah, most of it comes from Ethiopia, if not all of it. Yeah. yeah. So we sit up all night eating this cod, and he's teaching me the alphabet. Alif, ba, ta, ta, wow. jim. So by fajr, there wasn't any salad or fajr or anything but that, but at least he, <laughs> he was teaching me the alphabet, you know, and that was, yeah. that was great. You know. So by, by the time it's daybreak, so I know the alphabet now. Wow. And plus, I was a vegetarian, mm. you know, as all good hippies are, you know. Yeah. So, and now he says, but so I, even in Ethiopia, I wouldn't eat meat, and that was a big thing in, in all these countries. Meat is. Oh, you know, yeah. But I would never eat meat. But he said, no, but in Islam, you know, our prophet ate meat, and you, you got to eat. Okay, okay. Forget fetch. Say. <laughs> Don't worry about fetch. <laughs> eat meat. <laughs> but eat meat. At least, you know. Yeah. Okay. So I, so I ate that meat, and I got sick as a dog, but oh, it was man. fine. I well, said, your nervous okay. system is not. Your, huh? your digestive yeah, system yeah, is not. Yeah, yeah, I'm used, used to that. Plus. Ethiopian food, I don't know if you've seen it, it's as red as your couch here. With spices? With with, with red pepper. Yeah, okay. Wow. I mean, when they eat it, wow. that's part of their, the, if they're talking, and, they're yeah. doing, and, I, and I figured out why, because they eat so much red pepper. Wow. They just, it's, it's like, it, no, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. It like clears Indians, out your uh, Yeah, I don't know what the why, but uh, that's what they do. Mm. Anyway, so now, now I'm a Muslim, Kalas, that's it. Yeah. I'm a Muslim, and, I, and now I, I'm going to go back to Addis Ababa, and I'm going to go start learning Arabic, and I'm going to and I'm going to be a Muslim now. That's it. So I go and tell my buddy, mm. I'm going. Oh, you know, and that was like, come Scandal. on, man, you yeah. know, can't you know we're brothers and you know, I said, sorry, <laughs> man, that's that's the end. I'm I'm going. So I went back to Addis Ababa, and uh, and I don't know anybody. I don't you know, know what I'm doing, but like everywhere else, okay. He's going to show me what to do. So I went down to the middle of the city. Our Ethiopian brother would know that. In Marcado. 
There's a big masjid down there in the, in the center of the city. We're always in the ghetto, you know, Muslims, right? You know, mm -hmm. That's how we... So, I get this little room down there. And, uh, subhanAllah. So I get this room, and I'm right next to the masjid, and I want to now start being a Muslim. So the first thing I want to do is learn how to pray, right? Yeah. So I went to my, you know, these, these there were some students or workers or whatever, and, you know, okay, I'm a Muslim, guys, you know, just like you, and so I want to pray. Can you teach me how to pray? So, well, we don't know how, but let's it's, go see if he knows, you know. And so, SubhanAllah. So I went to, you know, so ultimately they said, well, none of us really know how to pray, but just go to the mosque and then do what the people do and you'll be okay. <laughs> I said, okay. So I went to the masjid and it was it was Juma. Salat al Juma, in fact. So you think that this is every prayer? Huh? In your mind, was this like, oh, five times a day we're going to have Juma? <laughs> well, I don't recollect that that uh, somehow, I mean, I, no, I didn't even like know. Like you knew that. that this was specific? It just so happened. I mean, it just yeah. randomly, that's when I picked to go and it okay. just happened to be Juma. Yeah. Okay. So I get in and it's, I'm, I'm a little bit late and uh, like I was right in the back and the whole place was packed and I was right in the very last row inside the masjid. And so then Allahu Akbar, you know, there's a khutbah and then I saw they stand up and they, okay, just do what they do. So, you know, what are they doing? Allah, okay, Allah Akbar. And we're cool. <laughs> so I'm just, you know, checking them out and following yeah. along and I'm okay. And then when I leave the masjid, then I see they're all offering nawafil Mm -hmm. You know, uh, on the steps and outside. I said, oh, I guess you're supposed to do that too. So let me do yeah. that. You know. But the problem was I had forgotten the sequence exactly yeah. and exactly how to. So so people started noticing that this guy looks weird, you know. Yeah, strange. he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. And, to, and you know, Ethiopia, particularly that time, it wasn't like a tourist spot. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not used to having people. So it's like, you know, then they just started gathering around and pointing at me and like, you know, what's this guy? Who's. Who, 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 and I thought, oh my God, you know, this is my first and my last salat, you know. Oh. <laughs> and then ultimately somebody comes up and said something and they all disperse. Mm. So, um, I don't know, it was an angel or what. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, so then I went to Harar and I went to Diradaw and these places, you know, the traditional very continent that I started. That's where I started learning. And, and uh, but yes, nobody said, okay, say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad, ashhadu wa No, that's right. I, First shahada would have been when I learned to say shahada myself. To shahada. Ajib. Subhanallah. And then it went on and on, and then ultimately I went to Yemen. You know what I love about these uh, the stories of uh, people coming to Islam, or they make tawbah into, into practicing as a Muslim, is that from Allah's name, al-Zahir, they outwardly manifest. Mm. That means, like, to, to know that this religion is the truth should not take any more than a commonsensical and fitri investigation. Yeah. It's like your like your journey, and it's there's no investigation of theory. Yeah, there's no absolutely. There's not much thinking. It's just being there, and yeah. then contrasting it with other groups. Yeah, right. And then even the the salah is something. It's the most important part of the religion. If there's a mosque, that's the easiest way to learn. And all you have to do is ask what What do you say when you're silent? Right. Like in, when in rukur, what are you all saying? In sujood, what are you all saying? Right when you're silent, what are you all saying? And it takes just a study of Fatiha and one surah. But Fatiha, you don't even need to study. If someone just keeps going to the masjid, you're going to hear Fatiha enough. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to yeah. memorize it eventually in a few days, yeah. right? A few months, weeks. I mean, uh, so it's a zahir. It's like just like the sun and the moon and the ocean and the plants are out there. Mm -hmm. The truth, the true religion, is going to be just out there. Yeah, it, it just needs to be seen yeah. by people. Most of the people accept Islam here, and as you said. Most you have people who are academic by nature, by yeah. you know, by background, and they would approach it like that. They're, they're very few. Most but, of the people, and believe it or not, I think they have a harder time because in you're going to have to rationalize the whole thing, and yeah, in, in, in logic, even in, in our books, they say that one of the hardest things to prove is that which is most obvious because it's not meant to be treated like that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's meant exactly. to like you look at, you see it, right? Yeah, exactly. You look at it, you know it when you see it. So some truths are meant to be like that, right? You know it when you see it. If you try to prove, you know, like the most obvious things, it's very difficult. How right? do you prove the sun is actually there? In the yeah, sky? exactly. How do you prove, like, so you, this, an, another simple, how do you prove logic? That the permissibility of use of logic. Like you can't because you need logic to even discuss that question, right? <laughs> you can't prove rationally things that are very obvious. 
And, and that's one of the beauties of uh, of the deen is that all you need to do is just be exposed. And yeah. uh, Habib Omar said that one of the reasons the Prophet ﷺ used to take loans from the Jews is tawsiya da'irat al-ittisal. Just an excuse to have a meeting. It's like an excuse to have a meeting, which is part of the purpose of the soup kitchen. Like, we don't do any da'wah. Just let, just you're going to come see us after, you know, regularly, you know, once a week. And some of these kids, hopefully, when we have a seven-day di- uh, dinner, some kids will see us five times a week. Just interaction is enough. Over a long period of time, you're going to know that this is, this is real and this is, this is true and this is not. Like, these people are different. Every single time I interact with them, they're different than everybody else. And that's the whole point of Dawa, right? It's, it's, it doesn't have to be an explicit speech. Absolutely. You know? So then, it, it, how long did you stay in Ethiopia? <clears throat> so Ethiopia, I stayed there for about seven months. And uh, what ultimately happened there was, uh, and I really liked it there, and... Uh, I was telling uh, you know, Maheen, you know, that uh, a, 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 an example of the karam, unprecedented karam that you would see, this happened a number of occasions. So I'm just walking down in Harar, hmm. which is uh, one of the very, you know, uh, very prominent seats of learning and Shaykh and Tsawuf and amazing place. That's the where the uh, mud. Harari comes from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. yeah. And uh, the houses are all mud, but they're just so immaculate. I mean, mm, it's so beautiful, and you feel so comfortable there. And clean. Everything's mud, but everything is spick and span, just you know, absolutely immaculately clean. So what happened is I mentioned during that time, uh, during the time of Hadi Selassie, and probably it's may be similar now, that uh, there's a lot of suspicion. And by the way, Ethiopia is one of those places that has never actually been colonized. Mm. Yeah. The Italians, for seven years, they managed to get certain pockets, and they were... So the Ethiopians, by, you know, by his, historically, are very vigilant on anybody trying to come in and... I used to make fun of my Italian friends about this, because in history we read that Italy wanted a piece of the pie. So they got involved in Libya for a little bit, then they got involved and tried to take over Ethiopia. <laughs> and at that time... Ethiopia was going through serious famine. So Ethiopia was always on TV for like, these people were so poor, right? Yeah. And then we, re- we were reading in history class how the Ethiopians beat the Italians. <laughs> I was like, you guys, man. <laughs> you guys lost to them? <laughs> right? Yeah. But I'll tell you, they're fierce warriors also. Yeah. yeah, yeah they, well, they got like a history of... Yeah, well. and, and so they're very, you know, abia, you know, they have mm. this, uh, uh, this uh, national sort of pride and that... Uh, they're all they're vigilant that anybody would try and you know, you know. This was an amazing zoom in on, um, and it reminded me a little bit of a story about a woman from uh, that they eventually made a movie about. She's she's actually from Pennsylvania, where this woman, she is a regular. This is we're talking the nineties and the two thousands. She's like a regular, um, well off, um, American woman who has no beliefs. She doesn't believe in anything, and she's she's got through a divorce, and then she's totally lost, right? And from the outside, you think she's got everything going for her in terms of her life. She's got money, she's got health, she's got everything. But inside, she's totally lost. She goes through this divorce, and then she starts traveling the world as a therapy, like looking for stuff. She goes to India, she goes to... And then the biggest experience that she had, she goes to like... Um, Bali, Indonesia, mm. and then she's in a, like a little hut. I think there, I, I saw yeah. that. Yeah. And she gets so sick. I right? saw that, yeah, yeah. And it was an Indonesian woman. And this is like literally right after 9-11. So she's coming back and she's like, I don't care what anyone says about Muslim people. Like whatever they did, that's like a small group. Because this woman, she did not even like speak any word of English. She just saw me sick every day. She'd bring me soup. She'd bring me food. She'd take care of me, right, for like weeks on end until I came back to health. And, but it reminded me of that, that it's just the Muhammad. Yeah. It's just the generosity of people. And if it's the truth, if this religion is the truth, it's got to trickle down to everybody, right? And it's got to make everyone a bit happier. Like what you said that, but if it's the truth, 
like everything in the in in the world that we see, which is the creation, everything's beautiful in the creation, right? Like the stuff that's out there is always always beautiful. The stuff that's not beautiful is always hidden. Like cockroaches go down. They don't come out on a nice spring day, right? <laughs> cockroaches go down. Rats are down, right? They're hidden. They're in the darknesses, right? So the bad stuff is hidden. Yeah. But what's out there is beautiful. Mm. Trees are beautiful, right? Mm. So therefore, if this is the truth, it's got to crop up and mm -hmm. everyone's got to touch everybody. Mm. So that's the approach that we should take. Like my takeaway from this is like, that's what, that's what that was got to be like. And Dawah can't be, you can't hold yourself back, right? If it's true, you got to be there. Be out there. Let Absolutely. people interact with you Absolutely. if it's true. Yeah. So this is really like, somewhat, the, 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 it would be nice to have a, to make a movie about this, actually. <laughs> like it would be one of those movies where it starts off in Colorado, then yeah. in California, then you take this well, trip. Well, hopefully it's going to be a book. I'm working on that kind of. That would be great. You know, just, and أُقَدِّمُ رِجَّنْ وَأَخِرْ أُخْرَى kind of thing. Well, we haven't even, uh, maybe at MBIC Friday. And for all those who are watching from New Jersey and New York, you can come down and meet Sheikh Hashim in, New Jer in MBIC. We're going to have a women's program first at 6 o'clock. And, um, and then we're going to have a community-wide program at 7.45, which is after Aisha. 7.30 we pray Aisha, and then 7.45. And then we'll have dinner. So at that program, Sheikh Hashim will give his message and the takeaways from his, you're going to be talking to mostly born Muslims. So, the, you know, the, one of the wisdoms that you have to offer is that you have the contrast. Mm -hmm. And although that contrast may be from another era, right, it's a different contrast, but nonetheless, like your advice is going to be very valuable. Uh, family related advice and then just general community related advice on how we how we can spark ourselves and we always have to have a spark mm -hmm. like there can never be a moment of dullness and boredom with Allah you should consider that a sin absolutely like if you find that you're standing in the in the presence of Allah you're and you're just not in it that there's something wrong right because look at the world around you he has so much you just have to at least get yourself going somehow by asking him for something right for his karam that is ibadah absolutely. man lam yas'al so that's what we're going to be looking forward to we have time maybe for one or two questions only and you have a question and here we got Oz welcome back from Egypt Oz come and say salam to our sheikh inshallah Oz grew up with your son by the way oh, right? yeah? didn't yeah. you go to Trenton yes. Abdurrahman yes. Abdurrahman yes. Yeah. he was my Quran teacher yeah. mashallah for, I think three or four years Trenton and Lawrenceville as well. Mashallah. Yeah. Mashallah. Okay. Very, very, like, one of my first teachers ever. Yeah. Mashallah. Pray for him. Oz, uh, welcome father. back. Uh, and you look like you, you Bro, I feed this boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? He like seriously lost weight, right? Yeah, I hope you send, take all your clothes, send it to the dry cleaner now. Defumigate cockroach eggs. <laughs> he just came back from Cairo, right? Oh, yeah. Defumigate all of your socks. No, my, your my books, my everything, not allowed in the house yet. No, your, your mom's not Mom going to allow it. One, one week quarantine. One week yeah, quarantine yeah. it no, out. Yeah, you're right. She's yeah. right, right? Quarantine Absolutely. it all out. Yeah. And then uh, we need to feed him. <laughs> Stuff him like an Egyptian mashi <laughs> to get <laughs> get your weight back up. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, question. I got, I got okay, go ahead. Go. So, subhanAllah, this was a beautiful journey. So, I feel like the whole this whole idea was like compressed into this journey. Because I know before I was a Muslim personally, there's this idea. And as Muslims, we know that we seek the afterlife. We seek the ru'ya of Allah Ta'ala. We seek company with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all the Anbiya, Alayhi Salam, and all the Salihin and the Awliya in Jannah. And everything that is mentioned in the Quran. But then there's also this concept of it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Mm -hmm. And like it kind of, your whole story kind of reminded me of that. What, what's our viewpoint on that in Islam? Like it's, the destination is laid out in front of us in many ayats. But yeah. like, what about the journey? What about the journey? Did you ever reflect on this? That the one dua that is wajib, there's only one dua that you have to ask from Allah SWT. If I don't ask for health, wealth, children, success in my profession, I'm not going to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. I don't have to ask that. That's nice. I'm not saying, that's good to ask for everything. As the uh, Sheikh said, if you don't ask Allah, then Allah, you know, gets angry. 
But what is the thing that we have to ask for continuously? It's guidance, mm -hmm. right? And and what are we asking guidance for? This is very interesting. This is the point. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. You ask to put us on the right path, the mm -hmm. journey. You know, therefore the ulama say, it, it's, where is your ultimate destination? Wherever Allah is going to take you. In Ethiopia, mm -hmm. some of the first Muslims, that, before I actually accepted Islam, you had these guys that would walk these kind of, you know, pseudo or semi-Sufi or whatever they were, I don't know. But anyway, they would just walk around with these big misbahas, you know, these big tasbihs, and they were just, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. You know, everything was, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And they'd just be walking around these groups, and uh, so I saw these guys, and these guys look like hippies to me, you know. I yeah. said, hey, wow, these guys are cool. What are you guys saying? Alhamdulillah, praise God. Hey, yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Where was this? Yeah, this is Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa. But you'd see these guys around different places. There's a name of this tribe that, it's a tribe that, like. So then I said, where are you guys going? Wherever Allah takes us. What are you going to eat? Whatever Allah feeds us. <laughs> I mean, these guys talk <laughs> On steroids kind wow. of thing, yeah. yeah. These guys were, I said, you guys are great. Come on, come with me. I <laughs> took them home, you know. And I was living with another musician, and the guy said, where'd you get these guys, you know? What, what are they doing here? Yeah. Said, these guys are cool. Listen to what they got to say. So yeah. I wasn't even a Muslim. But the point is, is that, you know, idina sirat al mustaqim to be on the path. You know, you're on the path, alhamdulillah. And that's amazing. We don't want to get off the path. You know, when Nabi Muslim said, this is the path, and these are the subul, don't get, snatched away and, and wander off the path as long as you're on the path that's the and all that other stuff that's the fringe benefits yeah, you know yeah and that's the motivation as human beings you know what's in it for me you know yeah but actually being on the path if we're on the path that's all gonna it's all gonna fall into place yeah but being on that path and therefore you know it, it would be of great help to us particularly here in this day and age in this country in our position because a lot of times we don't see what we want to see mm-hmm Right. Nobody's listening. Nobody's paying attention. This, these obstacles are, are, are appearing. You know, and nothing's coming. Nothing's you know falling into place. That doesn't matter. Are you on the path? Mm -hmm. You're on the on the on the journey. Then everything's fine. Just about said you know just okay. And all that other stuff that's going to come. And it doesn't mean I'm not discounting any of those favors. I want all of that too. You know, but being on the path. If we if we're on the path, then we'll make it. So yeah, it is the journey, being on the path. Allah keep us on it. I mean, here is Allah. here is the question: um, What is the f number one thing? I think you just answered it actually. That you would advise new converts. I think that's that's uh, you just basically said it. Yeah, like look for the, p the right path, and the right mm -hmm. path to it's something that um, it unfolds over time, and it unfolds by suhba. Exactly. That's that's what I would have yeah. said. Yeah. You'll get what you need because not everyone's going to need the same thing. Like yeah. we could say academically as a curriculum, you need what you need to study. We can objectively say that. Aqeeda yeah. tahara uh, salah. Right. We can say that, but that might not. But beyond that, people may need specific things. Yeah. Like some people may need different medicines yeah. for what they're Absolutely. going through. Absolutely. You know. But I think you hit on the main thing, and that is connecting with the connected. Yeah. I have this saying. Connect with the connected, disconnect with the disconnected. Mm. So if we connect with the right people, the right environments, you know, whatever that need might be, and so it's going to be helpful. If we don't do that, it's going to be extremely difficult, mm -hmm. if not impossible. And the good news is, um, today we have these facilities available. When we became Muslims, it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. There was no infrastructure. There was no ulama. There was no. There was one hafiz of Quran in the whole country. Subhanallah. Yeah. Subhanallah. It was it was a desert. It was a, it was this, and and it, I, and I'm from California. When I went back to California, I, I came over here to New York because only in New York was there anything happening, you know. Mm. And even with that, it was only two three places in New York, and not many people knew anything. Mm. You know, we were all like, and we made a lot of blunders, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of blunders, and so connect with. The, Look for the people that you can relate to and be sure that they're credible. Yeah. There's a lot of bogus stuff floating around out there, you know, and, and <clears throat> exposure to the internet is very, very dangerous. So be careful about that. Well, one of the things that I notice is that um, because Islam is, met, is very public, that if you expose yourself to a lot of different masajid and groups, it may be a bit dizzying in the beginning. Yeah. But it's one of the best ways to actually realize what is the Islam that there's no doubt about it. 
and what is totally fringe. Mm. And then everything else will be a difference of opinion, right? Like, does not have to be just one way. Yeah. But that's one of the best things is when you go to so many, and I think Sheikh Nuh Keller wrote about the Tablighi Jama'ah. It's like one of the blessings of these people is that they really know what is totally agreed upon and what will never be separated from Islam, what you can totally disagree on, and what will never be Islam. Mm -hmm. Just because how many mosques they've been to, how many Muslims have they seen, how many groups have they been. Uh, It may not be something that you want to do to somebody, but if you have no other way of learning, just observing a a huge, what do they call it in, in statistics? Like a, a, a sample size. That's the word. Like the samples, this sample size cannot be wrong. Right? <laughs> so they all pray five times a day, 100% of them. Yeah. Right? Except like one group. So you know that group is, is different. Right? Mm. And they all, but they don't all pray the same way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but they all pray five times a day. So that's basically the sample size is, is extremely important. When you listen to speakers on the internet, if you're going to go on the internet at all, the, and you're totally new to Islam, the best way to do it is to listen to everybody possible so that you won't be totally misguided and they'll balance it all out. Like if you're fair, if, I'm, if I want to study something and I have no clue about it, the right way to do it is not to get attached to anybody. Let's listen to everybody and see where's the common line. Mm. That's what's going to, the truth is going to be. Good, 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 good. Right? Yeah. So that's the advice to somebody who, um, let's say, I don't know what to do. I'm not going to put my eggs in one basket. All right, fine. Like the truth is going to rise up mm. over time mm. uh, by what everybody agrees on. So, because otherwise, then the message wasn't conveyed properly, right? And the essence of Islam has been conveyed properly. Yeah. One God, five prayers, afterlife. No, don't do drugs. Don't do zina. These basic fundamentals, and then once you stick to those, Allah will guide you after that. Yeah. Subhanallah. So, uh, yeah. let's see if there's any other questions before we wrap up. Um. It's a funny thing, someone was saying that in mathematics, one plus one equals two, it took 378 pages to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was chit-chatting with a mathematician. We have one of the founders of our mosque was a mathematician. Uh-huh. He's a math teacher. And um, I said, man, the, the new math is terrible. We all agree. Everyone, this ijma, mutawatu, that the new math, the way they teach kids, is terrible because it says like... Um, if John has three apples and Mary has three apples, how many apples are there? Six apples. The follow-up question, explain why, right? <laughs> it's like, but the, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer to it because three plus three is six. Then they say, well, what, uh, what's the principle? There's the commutative property. Which property is applied, right? Come Can on. you apply to this? I'm like, she's like six years old. They don't even have a chart. In my day, we did a chart. Right, one times one is one. One times two is two. We tables, had a chart, yeah, a, cha- a table, yeah. and they're asking her for a property. She never studied the table, right? But they they want her to know the property. She can't even add three. And she three can't even yet. barely yeah. add it, right? So um, I'm telling them this is nonsense, right? It's not something that's any use. And she's like, yeah, but they they need to know proofs later on, All right? So I'm like, what proof? Three for three plus three equals six. She's like, oh yeah, but I'm like. These are six fingers, right? So he's like, yeah, but that's not a mathematical proof. So I'm like, I'm against this science of yours, right? Because it, it, you can't complicate things so badly. Like how, are, you, are these guys like vying to create university positions by expanding their discipline so much that you need all this? You don't need any of this stuff, right? Well, it's all, it's a, it's a, it's a consumer, it's a consumer, you know, culture, right? That's what, so we have to have, can't keep selling the same book we need to, that's you know. exactly it right yeah that's no, it's it. all going to be uh, sadly enough it's all going to go back to economics some way yeah, or the other somebody's got to be making that's exactly it there's got to be all these disciplines they're inventing stuff to justify their positions right uh the the liberal arts they've they've transformed the liberal arts into they're trying to imitate the physicists by being complicated and complex and all that stuff whereas you go to the the past an oxford professor like what does he do he teaches the classics. Just like a sheikh. Like if it's a sheikh of Hanafi fiqh, sheikh of Maliki fiqh, Hanafi fiqh, for a thousand years, it's the same curriculum. What's your job? Teach, that, teach this curriculum. That's it. You don't need to innovate some bizarre idea <laughs> to justify your, your, your salary, right? Mm-hmm. That's what Oxford professor used to be. Teach Shakespeare, teach whatever that other guy's again, name, Monty, what's his name? 
uh, all these these ancient classics, right? That they used to teach. Mm. That's it. Mm. Uh, but they got to justify stuff. So anyway, that's my thing on 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 these mathematical proofs. Mm. All right, can we close? I gotta go you know what I tell I tell uh, I also have a property in my house called the uscutative property. <laughs> Right. <laughs> what is the uscutative problem? It allows parents to shut their kids up. Right? <laughs> no offense. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Great job. And we'll close now with a du'a. Inshallah, Bismillah. You can close with with a du'a Arabic or English, however you like it. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Abu Rakhliqi, wa Ridha wa Nafsi, wa Zina Tarshidadi Kalimati. اللهم لا نرسي ثنان عليك أنت كما ثنيت على نفسك ونصلي وصلي مبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك أحمد مجيد اللهم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا ولم تغفر لنا وترحمنا من الخاسدين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين اللهم أهدنا وأهدي بنا وجعلنا سببا لمن اهتدى اللهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم من النبيين والصديقين وشهداء وصالحين احسن اولئك رفيقا صل اللهم وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون سلاما والسليم الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك Jazakum Allah khairan. And uh, those who are attending our live stream, inshallah, we always do open QA. We will do a little bit of Shema'il tomorrow, and then we'll do the open QA that we usually do on Mondays. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. If you like what we're doing here at the Nothing But Facts podcast, uh, a live stream, you can support or be a supporter at patreon.com backslash Safina Society. Uh, people are asking what people usually ask how can we keep in touch with the sheikh online and I think the sheikh he's from a different era you don't go and do you're not going to find the sheikh hey we're all live now no, it's not the the sheikh you need to come and take the drive up Friday night uh, and and uh, uh, and come at uh, six o'clock to MBIC, and you can keep keep the sheikh's company, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, thank you so much. Oh, baby.